Our scripture comes to us today from the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Hear these words beginning with the 14th verse. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and trusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The, ma the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of more things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have abundance. Whoever does not have even what they will have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Holy and precious God, we thank you so much for this day. And Lord, we thank you for the rain. As we gather inside, Lord, let your spirit fall as the rain has fallen outside. Lord, draw us close and allow us to experience your presence, your touch, but even more than that, your, your transformation. Lord, we love you. And we give it to you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, by now, many of you know that my roots are not in the state of Texas. Oops. Um, I am from a small town in Mississippi. And believe it or not, we have some folks that just came back in our earlier service from a trip through Mississippi, and they talked about how beautiful the state is. And, and if you've never been through Mississippi, it's definitely a, a beautiful state. Uh, but it's by no means a place that many folks find on travel bureaus that they go to for vacation. I mean, we go to places like Mexico or, or New York or, or San Antonio, but Loosedale, Mississippi is not high on the map of most folks' travel plans. Uh, that being the case, as a child, we had tons of people that would come and visit my family. One, one reason because my parents were just such the hospitable people, uh, and my mom is the perfect southern belle. But also, as I began to wonder why that was, it, it dawned on me is because Loosedale is close to a lot of places you can go and see. Uh, one place that, that people would come and see us to go and see would be New Orleans, Louisiana. You know, back in the 70s and in, in the 80s, New Orleans was really just beginning to, to be known around the, the country. And so what would happen is folks would come and visit us so that my parents could take them to New Orleans and show them the sights and the sound. Please. Bourbon Street. Y'all heard of Bourbon Street? Sodom and Gomorrah. Woo! 
Well, as my as times passed, I I noticed that there was a, a, a definite fall away of those people that would come and stay with us, and and my parents didn't take them sightseeing, and and one day I, I came to ask my mom, why is it that that you don't take people to New Orleans like you used to? To which my mom said the last time she was there, she said as I was making my way down the center of the street, and they did go down the center street. They didn't go on the they, they'd go down the center street going. <laughs> as she made her way down the street, she said the thought crossed my mind. If Jesus came back today, how in the world would I answer the question, why am I here? I mean, how could I explain my presence in a place such slight as that if Jesus were to come back today? You know, as I think about that, it leads to our first point to ponder. Some worries and fears that we have are healthy. But most rob us of the more precious things in life. And I want you to think about that. There are those fears in our life that are healthy, that keep us out of bad places, that keep us on the straight and narrow, that, that allow us not to step off into, into too deep of waters. But in truth, most of the fears that we have steal life rather than give life. This day we're continuing a, a sermon series that was entitled Stories of Life, the Parables of Jesus. And, and we find ourselves talking about the parable of the talents. Now, Leanne, thank you so much. You read great. In that modern translation, talents are translated into bags of gold. But for me, I'm going to talk more from a talent deal because it has so much more history in the church, but also connection to me. Now, as we think about the parable of talents, that conversation came to us out of a con that story came to us out of a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. Now, this is in time of, of his final days here on this world. He's in Jerusalem in the final days before his arrest, his crucifixion, and his death. And, and he's there teaching in the temple. And as he leaves the temple, as he goes outside, his disciples call his attention to just the blue beauty and the splendor of the stones on the temple and just how magnificent they are. And in the 24th chapter, Jesus says these words. Do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. In response to, to what Jesus said there, I think because it, it troubled the disciples so much at a later date, they came to him privately, came to him in, in private and asked him this question. Tell us, Lord, when will this happen and what will be a sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So in their nervousness, they asked Jesus about the end of the age. And the whole bulk of the 24th and the 25th chapters of Matthew are made up of a genre of parables that speak on the eschaton, the end of times. Now I have to tell you, as I'm talking about this, I, I see everybody squirming and worrying. This is going to be another hellfire and damnation type sermon. In all, in all honesty, th there is this part of us that does not like to talk about the end of times. It's something we want to like to think about, talk about, partially because we like the life that we have, right? And it's great, and we want to talk about it coming to a close early. Something else that bothers us is that, that, that there's something about the end of times that, that causes an uneasiness in our spirit, not understanding what it might be like. But even more than that, I, I think one problem that we have with thinking about the end of times is, is that we understand that a part of the whole process has a part where we are judged. And none of us, nobody, likes to be judged. So given our choice, we, we talk about those things that we like about our faith, the, 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 the truth, the, the grace, the forgiveness, the hope, the promise. And we need to spend the bulk of our time on that. But, but we need never forget that as Christians, we do, do believe that Christ is coming again. Amen? And it's hard to deny that in the scriptures, there are those stories like this one that paint a picture 
an undeniable picture that God has expectations on our lives. And knowing that, is it not important that we find ourselves ready and faithful? Well, that's what today's sermon is all about. Again, going back to the story that we read, we have a man of sub, some, some substance who leaves on a journey and he calls together three of his servants. And to one he gives five talents. To another he gives two and to the last he gives one. And in talking about talents, I just want to let you know that, that a talent of their day was something that is totally different than a talent of the day in which we would expect. You know, when we think about talent, we think of things like, like music and sports or even being able to spot those things that might pass by someone else's eye. But it's interesting to note that, that our understanding of talents comes to us exactly from this parable. And in fact, in the earliest days, a talent was, was a measure of weight. It was only in the time of Jesus that it began to, to stand for a, a large sum of gold or silver. And we're told as this, as this wealthy man leaves, he does leave to his servants three different amounts of money. And upon his return, two have doubled what they've been given. And you know that they have to come to the master with, with a little bit of sense of pride and a little bit of sense of expectancy as they say, here's what you've given and here's what I've got. And their joy is hearing the words that, that so many of us long for. Maybe not exactly, but, but in the same form and fashion. You see, the master said to them, well done. Good and faithful servant. Come in and enjoy your master's happiness. But the last one, having buried his talent for safekeeping, appeared before his owner having exactly what he'd been left with. And in that scenario, he, his fears came true. And we find ourselves a little bit surprised at, at the words in which were shared with him. You lazy, wicked servant. You know, that does sound pretty harsh. And to have someone that, that did their best seemingly to, to take care of what they've been given, to come in not having lost anything. And to find themselves given such harsh criticism. I mean, after all, as we think of this, this one servant, he couldn't have been all that bad. I mean, he was good enough for the master to see the potential and he left him some of his fortune. And it's not as if this guy squandered or dealt dishonestly with what he was given. No. It seems as though the servant's greatest downfall was his lack of self-confidence. You see, his worry and his fear of what he couldn't accomplish or all the bad things that could happen or might happen, they overshadowed all the possible possibilities or all the potential for good that, that he held within his hands. You see, for the one servant, his fear paralyzed him and separated him from the very joy that, that those around him we're free to experience. You know, I think sometimes we forget just how powerful a force fear really is. If you think about it, it can dictate who we are, where we live, the goals that we have, even how we treat the things that we've been given. For the servant in, in the story, He'd been given money. That was his talent. And instead of going out and using it, his fears caused him to take it and, and to protect it and, and to bury it. 
trouble is, is money is not meant to be buried. It's meant to be used. Money, like all the things that we have in our life, are just tools that when placed in the hands of good people, do good things. In every moment that we don't use our talents, whether it's monies, whether it's our passions, whether it's our dreams, whether it's our voice, every moment that those are not used for good in the kingdom of God is wasted. And by default, if you think about it, life is wasted. Some of us waste life in obvious ways. A couple of weeks ago we talked about the story of the prodigal son and how he took his father's inheritance and, and went off into a distant land and squandered it on wild living. But even more troubling are those instances by which we waste life through more socially accepted means. I mean, both are, are heartbreaking and tragic, but only the latter is rarely named. Only the latter is able to sneak through and never be, be called out for what it is so that it might be corrected. And even our, our smallest fears and worries can, can impact, have great impact on our life. Whether we're talking about reaching out a hand to meet somebody new in the church or along the street. Think of the, think of the blessings that we miss by not being able to get to connect with people like that. Or how about those times that we're scared to, to offer help or, or assistance to those in need because we're scared of what they might do with their gift or, or their intentions or what their life is like. How about the fear that we have in, in sharing with those around us just how vital and, and life-changing the amazing grace of God is in our life, in our world. You see, our fear paralyzes us, but oftentimes we don't even recognize it because it's never called out. You see, if we're not careful, our fears and our worries can keep us quiet and secluded and distant from, from the happiness with which the Father offers. You see, on the one hand, we, we have fear. And it is a part of our life. But, but, but back counter, counterbalancing that is our faith. And Jesus said, even the faith of a mustard seed can move mountains. You see, within our life, there are risks that, that have to be taken. But it's only as we risk through loving and serving and giving and using the gifts that we have that, that we open ourselves to, to the best parts of life. All that God has to offer. I got a clip I want to show you. And it, I, 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 I hesitate in showing it because it kind of takes us off subject but hopefully brings it back on. Uh, here is a good rule of thumb, or potential lack thereof. Table saws can bite. A quick demonstration. Wood. T-bone steak. Wood. Steak. Wood. Steak. Are we clear on this? Yeah, there's about 60,000 medically treated accidents on table saws every year. About 3,000 people take their fingers off, about 10 a day. Ah, oh, 10 a day. Steve Gass, a lifelong woodworker, is trying to bring that number 10 down to zero. He has developed a system that stops the blade of a saw if it comes in contact with your finger. He calls it Saw Stop. The system can tell the difference between your finger and the wood. So when you're cutting wood, if you accidentally run your hand into the blade, it'll stop it so quickly that you just get a little lick instead of maybe taking some fingers off. The blade is a sensor. 
that detects electrical conductivity. A piece of wood is not very conductive, so the saw goes right through it. A salty, wet finger is conductive. Well, it's a lot like a touch lamp. There's a small electrical signal on there, conducts that signal into my body, my body absorbs some of the signal, and that triggers the system. It'll detect that in less than a thousandth of a second. And any volunteers? Hey, over there in the fridge. Yeah, you. Yes, That's right. we're going to use a salty, wet, conductive, all-beef frame. So I'll hold it just like it was my thumb. you got to be kidding me. Let's see. There's nothing. Yes. That is amazing. That really is. It's I mean, an amazing idea, and it's implemented in a way where you're using energy for its own stop. Steve Gass is a true believer in his design, which brings us to our next demonstration. Steve is going to put his own finger into the table saw blade. Um, how are you feeling about this? Oh, a little nervous. <laughs> yes, you knew we had to go for it. You want to try putting your finger in there? And just but you are never going to try this at home, right? Yeah. Right? Finally. Lights. Camera. Conductivity. <laughs> you alright? Yep. There's no blood. There's nothing. No. Didn't hurt. Whew. This is a man who has faith in his creation. If you're like me, you're worn out just watching the clip. <laughs> but I think within that clip, there's so many things that we can draw from, from the analogy. I mean, think of the lives and the wounds that would not be prevented if there was not someone willing to risk a vision that God had given him. Think of the health and the wholeness that, that is born out of someone putting into practice that with which God has placed in their brain. There's no getting around the doubt and worry that we have in our life. But, but another thing, it's good to remember that, that God took a risk on you and I, His creation. I love the way this ends. Now this is a man who has faith in His creation. Have you ever wondered about how much faith that God has in us? In trusting us with His most precious possession. His children and His creation. Yes, God took a risk on you and me, but it was a calculated risk. Rooted in His unlimited love and power. And in His faith and, and our willingness to, to participate in, in His plan. You see, it's when we use our gifts, our grace. When we fly for God, it's there... that the hope and the promise, the salvation that God desires, reaches those, us, who are broken and needy. You know, in thinking about it, perhaps our, our most damaging sins has, has less to do with what we think, say, and do. And more with our failure to trust God. You know, we all have those dark days of doubt. But it's only as we trust that the darkness and despair that clouds our life can be lifted. It's only as we trust that, that our fears and worries can ever really fade. It's only as we trust that we act and, and experience the blessings that God has to offer. You see, it's there where, where we're found faithful. It's there that we're called. And it's there that we experience the best things in life. 
Let's pray. Precious and holy God, Lord, it is awful hard sometimes for us to, to recognize that you have a plan for this world, our church, and our lives. Lord, it's awful easy for us to, to hang on to the things that are important. To give in to the fear of what we might look like or how poorly we might perform. Lord, help us to, to recognize your power, your call, and your plan for us as we seek to be a part of ushering in your kingdom. Lord, love on us.